What's up, everyone? This is Adam Frommel here with Dan Favalli on the Full Court Press. This is our first episode, and we're going to be bringing you our unfiltered thoughts on the NBA throughout the season. So, Dan, in the wake of the in the wake of the big news about Marcin Gortat being traded to the Washington Wizards, how do you see the Eastern Conference playoffs shaping up now? Um, I think it's going to be pretty messed up, actually. It's going to be, I think the Wizards uh, have solidified a spot now, probably at this point, unless John Wall goes down. I think you have them in, like, the top five or six in the conference now, am I right? Yeah, I've got them at number six, just behind the Knicks. I think they're actually close to that level now. You think they're better than the Knicks? I don't think they're better than the Knicks, but I think that they could beat the Knicks in a head-to-head matchup, especially because there's no way that Raymond Felton can hang with John Wall, especially if he keeps eating donuts. <laughs> All right, so if you were to start with, let's start with the eighth seed. Who do you think is going to get that last spot in the conference? I think it's going to come down to the Detroit Pistons and the Atlanta Hawks. Now, I'm a Hawks fan, so I'm a little biased here. But I think that team just has a little bit more depth and less concerns. They're undersized, sure, but at least they don't have those floor spacing issues that Detroit's sure to have. It's, it's affected Greg Monroe pretty negatively so far during the preseason. Yes, small sample size warnings and all that. But after years of watching Josh Smith jack up threes, I just I, I can't count on him providing that spacing that's so necessary. Yeah, I don't think that the Pistons are going to make the playoffs. I, I joke and I say that they're going to be better without Brandon Jennings, but they're actually going to be a lot worse because he was at least some semblance of a floor general who might be able to tie this mess together because Chauncey Billups just isn't going to do it. He's never really been a great point guard. He's been an undersized too his entire career. So I think that's going to hurt them a lot. And I could see them trading Greg Monroe and not getting an immediate return on him too. So that could also hurt them this season as well. Um I'm probably a little bit higher on the Hawks than you are. If I had to pick the eighth playoff seed right now, I would be going with the Cavs. Uh, And they might even miss it. I'm worried about Andrew Bynum's knee, as always. But the Cavs have a lot of young talent. If Kyrie stays uh, healthy, if Waiters stays healthy, if Bennett plays like a number one pick, and Verajal stays healthy, they'll be really fun to watch. So right now, I got them in that eighth slot. See, and you didn't even mention Tristan Thompson, who's pretty much the sole reason, besides Kyrie Irving, of course, that I have the Cavs at number seven. Uh, Thompson's my preseason pick for most improved player. I love what I've seen from him this preseason after shooting switching ha- after sh- switching shooting hands, and kind of wish I'd done that when I used to play. Um, now, wait, great- what do you what do you think he's gonna do to earn most improved player of the year? Like that's what I'm really curious about. Like, what is this jump that you see him making? I can see him going like 14 points, nine and a half, ten rebounds a game. And shooting like fifty five percent from the field, but the biggest improvement is going to be him not him not being a liability at the free throw line. Though, like as simple as that sounds, he shot what like forty nine percent last year. He's been at sixty one in the preseason. So if if he can do that, he can stay on the court for crunch situations and and bring a solid defensive and rebounding presence that they need to keep Barrage out and find him healthy. Yeah, I mean, uh, geez, I'm still not sold on that. I'll need a few games to see if I think that he could even be a candidate for that type of award, especially after watching Paul George win it this past year. So I would be, sh- I would personally be shocked to see him win that. At seven, I actually have the Wizards. Uh, Marcin Gortat is going to make them much better, gives them more depth down, low, uh, depth down low, which they needed really badly. But I'm not sure if they're going to be able to tie this together in time to make a top five or six worthy run. I'm not sure how, John, how healthy John Wall is going to stay. He's looked pretty good in the preseason, and Beal has looked amazing in the preseason. But I'm interested to see, once Otto Porter gets healthy, how he fits into all this. I've never been sold on any of their wings for the most part. Uh, Trevor Rees is a pretty good defender. Martel Webster is awful. I can't believe they signed him to a pretty big deal this summer. So I think they're going to shoot the ball, and he brings that leadership, though, which they're going to need on that young team. He can shoot the ball sporadically. Last year was kind of an anomaly for him. He had a good year, not a great year, and it was kind of a long overdue thing. I'd be interested, and it was a contract year, so I'd be interested to see if he could follow it up. Now, I don't believe in him at all. That's just that's just a thing with me. But I, I think they'll make the playoffs. Now, I had I was confused. I thought maybe they'd be eighth or they might be able to fall behind the Raptors or the Pistons. But I think Marcin Gortat definitely makes them a playoff team. I just don't think they're going to get higher than seven at the moment. Yeah, see, I, I do have them all the way up at number six, and the Cavs are my number seven team. And the difference, the difference for me is Bradley Beal. That kid can shoot the ball. He had he had a historic rookie season from beyond the arc. Beyond the arc, I think he was only the ninth player in NBA history to shoot uh, like thirty nine percent with four attempts a game uh, as a rookie. And he's he's looked much better during the preseason, putting up twenty a game. He's got that inside outside game, and he complements Wall so well. 
I also, I also think that the presence of the two of them together, and they didn't play much because of the injuries last year, is going to keep Wall healthy because there won't be as much pressure on him to drive to the rim and take that contact. They'll definitely, they should be one of the best backcourts in the league in a few years, and I think they'll be fun to watch this year. I just, I don't believe them. But speaking of rookies, I've got your Hawks actually at number six because I've fallen in love with Dennis Schroeder. I don't understand why he's just, he seems like he's going to be a great point guard in the league, and I'm hoping that uh, the Hawks are smart enough to run him and Teague together for long stretches at a time because I think they'll do some damage. And I think they stayed mediocre this offseason. I don't think Josh Smith, was a huge loss, especially when you add Paul Millsap and Elton Brand, and my voice just cracked because that's awesome. But with uh, Al, Hol- Al Horford, I think that there's a six team in the East. That's what I would put them at right now. I know you have them as eight, but I got them as six. Do you think Schroeder and T can work together as undersized as that front court is, though? I mean, you're giving up a lot of size. and One of the reasons they're thinking about playing Kyle Korver at the two is just to compensate for that a little bit. I mean, you've got Paul Millsap who, long as his arms are, he's, he's not very tall. And Al Horford, we've always heard that he, he's better suited for the power forward than the center, even though that's not really true. But he, he does give up sides. And I don't know, if you, if you play the two together, ex- exciting as it may be, it, it might not result in as many wins. Well, the Eastern Conference is pretty small, like as it is. So I don't think they're giving up that much size. It could hurt them defensively, I guess, in terms of matchups. But I don't see it hurting them that much because the league is so small right now as it is. But the East especially, like I don't think that there's many teams that run with traditional fours and fives. So I think they're, they'll are they be able to work with that combo guard lineup and get some use out of it. I'm not saying run them together for 30, 35 minutes a game, but I think it's something that those two could come in and that could be one of their more potent offensive lineups. If you play that with Corver, Millsap, and Horford, uh, that's a pretty explosive five-man unit. Yeah, I, I think it would be fun for sure, and I don't think we should sleep on John Jenkins either. That kid can shoot. That kid can yeah. flat out fucking shoot. Just shoot. Oh, yeah. I wanted to see more of him last year. I was so upset because he can shoot like crazy. So we've gone over those teams at 8, 7, and 6, but num- number 5 seems to be pretty certain. It's it's the New York Knicks <laughs> in most people's books. And I know this is your team. Uh, I've, I've got them under 50 wins. 50 wins. Uh, they had 54 last year. I think they actually got better, but so too did like all of the East. So I just don't see them topping that again. Convince I- me. Uh, I can't convince you that they're going to win 54 games again because I feel like that would be tough for them to top with how the Bulls and the Pacers look right now. And, of course, the Nets, who might be the most overrated team in the NBA. But the Knicks are going to hit 50 wins. I If Melo's shoulder pops, yeah, then they're screwed. But the Knicks are going to hit 50 wins. At number five, I would have the Nets. I think there's going to be a lot to work out there in terms of chemistry. I think they'll be the team that struggles to win 50 games during the regular season. I do think they're built for the playoffs, but I think that well, Jason... Young, I'm not as concerned about their chemistry just because there's so much better in talent on that team. And don't give me the whole Jason Kidd is the coach thing because he's not the coach. Lawrence Frank is. Kidd is more of a figurehead than anything else. And if, if anybody's going to be able to pull them all together, it's it's Kevin Garnett. I mean, that, that guy is a born winner, and he's going to do everything he can to make sure that there's no selfishness in that lineup at all, which is so important for a team that has to spread the ball between all five starting spots. It's going to be hard for him to do that if he's going to be sitting on back-to-backs and not playing as much. And I know he'll fight Kid or quote-unquote Lawrence Frank for that, but he's going to miss time. They're going to have him miss time on purpose. But like I was saying, I think they are, they're going to be a really good playoff team, but I think it's going to be more about let's just survive the regular season, and I think that they're kind of at the point where they know they're going to be locked into that fourth or fifth seed, and that maybe, that's not going to change the matchup difference, so that they might just, they're going to play it safe in just my opinion, but I also think that with Deron Williams, Deron Williams' health issues, that's another thing that concerns me, because they need him. I love Pierce as a playmaker. But the Nets don't have a lot of depth on the bench. They've got some talent, but they they need they need Pierce and Williams, the, the two most important players on that team. Unless we see a uh, Sean Livingston renaissance season, he's looked pretty good during preseason. I mean, would it really be a renaissance when he's never really been great? I know he's seen spurts, but it really be a renaissance. I like to think that he was actually good before that knee injury that I never want to watch again. But I guess I guess renaissance is probably the wrong word there. Yeah, I mean, if he turns into... I don't, I don't want to use breakout either, because we're talking about a, a career backup point guard now. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's not going to be Jeremy Lin if he breaks out, quote-unquote, but they I just, they lack the depth, and I think that'd be their biggest thing. If if their starting five stays healthy, 
which I don't think it will. If you look up and down that list, with the exception of Pierce, maybe, all of them are just bruised and battered. Like, all of them. Like, Brook Lopez played a lot last year, but his, his feet worry me. Never thought I'd say that about players, but his feet are concerning. <laughs> See, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep disagreeing with you here for two reasons. And the first is Kirilenko. He's, he's such a Swiss Army knife that he can play at so many different positions. I think Because he's like LeBron, year, right, according to Jason Kidd? He's like LeBron? Yeah, something like that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, last year with the Wolves, he, he played at the 2, 3, 4, and actually a little bit of the 5. And that, that allows them to plug him into the lineup whenever one of the starters does need a rest. And the other thing is home court advantage is going to be so important for them in the playoffs if they have to face the Knicks or any of the other elite teams. So I, I think that we could see them knowing that they don't have quite as much depth and established talent um, working together. We could see them really push for any advantage they could get in the playoffs, especially because it's going to be so packed together right around four and five. Now, here's what, here's what I kind of see, though. Home court advantage, they kind of won't have if they wind up playing the Knicks because the Barclays Center is going to be filled with Knicks fans during the playoffs. Like, I know the Nets season ticket holders will show up in full force, but we don't even know how many of the next Nets season ticket holders are Knicks fans. So that's always been my concern is that I feel like if they play the Knicks in the playoffs, like I said, they are they might thrive off it because Pierce loves playing the villain, especially against the Knicks. But against the Knicks, that is kind of, I don't want to say disadvantage, but it is a disadvantage. Like, where is their home court? Like, the Knicks fans are going to come out in Brooklyn, and then they're going to have the Garden because they're just going to have the Garden. Trust me, I spent years going to Phillips Arena and hearing MVP chants for the other team. Like, <laughs> it happens. But... I have the Knicks at four. I have them winning the Atlantic. I have them coming in at fourth in the Western Conference. And I could even see the Knicks, probably the homer in me, but I don't think it is, making a run for that three seed. It wouldn't shock me if they can beat out the Pacers or the Bulls. So I won't go as high as two. It wouldn't. I wouldn't faint if they made two. Maybe I would faint. But I could see them making a play for the three. Like I said, I just they have the depth. I think in the regular season they're a great team. And I think what we've seen in the preseason has been a little bit deceptive in terms of they're not – they're shooting threes and spurts, but I think that three-point shooting is going to come together, which to me is great regular season basketball, which is what concerns me about the Nets. The Nets. Who's that three-point shooter on that team? Who's their gunner? Like, they can't shoot. I don't think, I don't think they have a, a designated gunner, but at the same time, they have a bunch of people who can space the court. I mean – Darren Williams can make threes, Joe can make threes, Paul Pierce can make threes, and then you have mid-range shots from KG and Lopez. So I don't know that you have that that guy that's going to hit you the big three when you really need it, but at the same time, you might not need it because you have so many options. And I I definitely see that, and having two bigs like uh, Brolo and KG is going to be awesome for them because so many times we see these traditional front courts not working because only one of them or neither of them can shoot mid-range Jays. But as we kind of saw in Boston the last couple seasons, it hurt KG offensively that, I mean, one, when Rondo wasn't on the floor, obviously, but when the Celtics didn't have those three-point shooters to help create that space for him down low so that he could actually post up or even create enough space to get off those mid-range twos. Like, his, he was shooting, like, his toes were almost on the three-point line a lot last season. And I feel like that's how he got his open shots. And I don't see the Nets having the necessary shooters, like above average shooters. Like, Joe Johnson's an average shooter. I guess you could make the case that Williams is definitely above average when he's healthy. Paul Pierce is probably above average. But I don't see them having enough above average shooters to really capitalize off Brolo and KG's range in the post. I can see that. And speaking of Lopez, can we just can we just note how awesome it is that he isn't saying you know at the end of every interview? I mean, it, I don't know if you ever watched tape of his interviews or caught any of them during a game, but... Every sentence ended with you know, so props to him for getting that out of his Stanford vocabulary. I'm not sure if I actually noticed that, but his voice does remind me of, like, some surfer bub who lives in, like, a V-dub bus. I don't know if you've ever gotten that vibe. He sounds like he's about to say cowabunga at the end of every sentence. I mean, I don't know what he drives, so... (laughs) So moving on to the three seed, uh, it's it's really going to come down to the Pacers and the Bulls, unless you're feeling, pardon the pun, pretty bullish on Chicago. So who you got there? It's tough for me. It's like a toss-up between those two. I like the Bulls better, but their health just scares the living hell out of me. And it's not even Derrick Rose. Noah, what? What was that? You're talking about Noah, aren't you? Yes, I'm worried about Noah more than I am worried about Rose. I'm worried about Taj Gibson more than I'm worried about Rose. 
I'm worried about Luol Deng more than I'm worried about Rose. And Tom Thibodeau does not know how to limit players' minutes. I don't, I don't understand it. Like, Joaquin Noah should not have been playing f- close to 40 minutes a game last year. Luol Deng should not have done it either. When they were hurt, it's not even like, you know what, we started out the season, this is going on. They got hurt, and he just runs those guys into the ground. I'd love to see what Dang could do if he was actually able to play like a normal 32 to 35 minutes a game. Efficiency's always been the thing that plagues him most, and if he actually like got to rest a little bit and, and use some more spurts of energy, he could actually deserve to make an all-star team. Yeah, I think what will be a major difference for that team, which is why I would probably have them above the Pacers, is Jimmy Butler. So I guess going back to the three, which I have is the Pacers, the reason why I could even see them slipping, maybe the four, is I don't think they're built for the regular season. I think they've got that depth and extra offense, but Danny Granger's not healthy again. So that's like whatever they were planning on doing, like I just don't think that's going to work out. I don't know if he's going to spend the whole season on the bench again, but I, I don't see him making that much of an impact. And... I'm not sure. I'm not sure how much Frank Vogel is going to trust some of these guys coming off the bench. I don't know if he's going to trust trust Chris Copeland enough in his defensive lineup to like to play. Like I just look back and I I can't I can't fathom how he'll put up with Copeland, who is a horrible defender, a horrible defender. Sure, and in, in general, we've pointed to the depth as like the reason that the Pacers are improving. I mean, their bench was about as shitty as it got last year, excluding the the, the Trailblazers, and like. Yes, they upgraded with Copeland and Luis Scola, but at the same time, how much of an upgrade is that? The only thing that's really going to help that is like if Danny Granger is healthy, which we can't count on. That that pushes either him or Lance Stevenson to the bench, and then you have three or four competent players coming off the pine if you include C.J. Watson. C.J. Uh, Watson. It's, it feels scary. <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, can we also maybe admit, and I know people hate me for this, there's probably two things people hate me for about the Pacers. Can we admit that Paul George is officially overrated? I'm seeing him in people's top 10 of players in the NBA. He's not a top 10 player. Not a top 10 player. And no, he shouldn't be. Maybe one day he'll be, but is he going to follow? Is he going to be as good as he was last season when he wasn't exactly great? Like, he was really good, but he's not efficient. He's a good three point shooter, which that team needs. But. Is he going to be able to, you know, now Granger's gone. Is Lance, was Lance Stevenson a fluke, or is, you know, Lance Stevenson an actual thing now? So they still have a lot George, of questions. George is really interesting to me because typically defense tends to get underrated. Like, it's not as easy for us to quantify. It's not as easy for us to, to really see what's happening, especially for, like, the average fan who might not tune into every game during the year. So George is almost being overrated because everyone knows he plays such good defense now. And, I mean, he even said the other day that he was the best wing defender in the league. Which is so just not true. It's Yeah, I don't think it's true at all. And it, it's a little weird that defense is actually the reason a player is getting overrated. But, like, yeah, I mean, he's not a top 10 guy. No way. And he's, you're, he's you're actually right. He's in the top right. 20 now. You're, you're, he's in the that, top 20, but just barely. Uh, yeah, I would agree with you there. You're, you're really right about that defense. I really didn't think about it until just now. But the people are actively ignoring his offense because, except for his playmaking, which is superior, which I love. Like, he can play that point forward role. But they're actively avoiding his scoring totals and his shooting percentages because they're not great. And you're right. They're relying on his defense, which is incredible. But it's not like, you know, if you, if you ask me, I'd rather have Tony Allen. I'd rather have LeBron out there. So... It, you're right. You don't see players getting overrated for their defense if their name isn't Dwight Howard. So it's just that's in, that's an incredible notion I did not think about until just now. Cool. Well, I, I have two main gripes with George, and the first is the shooting percentages that you mentioned. Like he's he's got to get more efficient and pick his shots better, which he might be able to do if Granger's healthy because they'll have more offensive options. And the other is his ball handling. Like, yeah, he's an incredible uh. playmaker. But if you watch him, he dribbles high. He dribbles away from his body. And if he gets caught in a double team, they're going the other way for an easy dunk. Like, it's it's pretty awful. And that's one of the things I'm most excited to watch for this year. Just if he's, if he's spent the offseason running those drills and, like, getting a better grip on his handles. Yeah, his he has some pretty sing shitty dribbling. And he averaged, like, what was it, close to four turnovers last year or something like that? So that will be interesting to see if he can develop that. But I also feel like he relies too much on his defense. Like, you don't... I feel like he's more of a spot-up shooter on offense. Like, he's best served as someone that Roy Hibbert or David West 
could kick it out to, or Granger could kick it out to off dribble penetration. I don't think he's someone who can create for himself off the dribble consistently. We know he can get to the rim. We've seen him fly. But I don't think he's someone who can just create his own offense at will. And I think he tries to too hard at times, and his shot selection is iffy, which doesn't help his shooting percentages, obviously. I think i got to add one word to that sentence, and that's I don't think he can create offense for himself yet. Yeah, you got to remember, this kid is young. He really is, and he's gonna be he's gonna be fantastic in a couple of years. And I think as soon as this season, we could be talking about him as a top ten guy. Well, I think that I'm probably just so down on him because people are way too high on him. So I, I really I gotta be the pessimist. I'm always the pessimist. I'm always ranking on him. I don't un, I like. I'm still just at a loss for words of how people have him ranked in the top ten right now. And it's not even just like oh I've seen it here, I've seen it there. I've just seen it everywhere, and it's just it's just getting ridiculous. But what's also a little ridiculous, and me and you have argued about this on numerous occasions, David West's contract. Three years, $36 million for a guy whose knees are questionable, way past 30. I think he's a great guy. He's a great locker room. Way past 30 is 32. That's way past 30 in the NBA. Okay. The NBA years are worse than dog years, so 32 <laughs> is way past 30. I He's a great player, and I love him. But can he hold up, too? Like, we're going to talk about Granger. We watched West hold up. What if, I mean, we watched uh, him hold up last season. What if he doesn't, like, hold up? And if he goes down, he, he to me, he might be, at at worst, he's their second most important player. From I what, think he's the first. Yeah, that's what I was about to say. I think he could be their most important player in terms of what he does in the locker room. And he's so smart on offense. He's, I'm not even talking about just in terms of scoring and shooting. He's just so smart with the way he sets screens. He sets better screens than Roy Hibbert. Well, he's also one of the most intimidating players on the court. Like, when you see him, you know that he's one of the players you just do not want to fuck with. Well, he's like Kevin Garnett, but people like him. So it's like he's got that, like, intimidating air about him. And you don't, you don't want to mess with him, like you said. So they need him. Like, he's there, like... You know what, take out Granger and George Hill from that lineup just so they can keep West, is what I would say. And You're right. Like, what happens if he does go down? Does Luis Scola become a starter? <laughs> yeah, and then they'll get no defense out of him, pretty much no rebounding. They'll just get which some nice... ruins their whole system. Yeah, they'll get some nice mid-range jumpers, which is not their system at all. So, I think they're a team... I don't want to say built on a house of cards, but I think they're a team that could... that definitely can get the three seed... But I think there's just as good a chance that they slip to, like, four. And I also, what I was saying before is I don't think they're a great regular season team. They're kind of grinded out style. Kind of like Memphis is better suited for the playoffs when the pace is slower. So I can see them making more noise in the playoffs than they do in the regular season. Like they did this past year. I can see that. So we sort of danced around the question so far. Like, who, who is the number two seed in the East? For me, it's the Bulls. It's the Bulls. We've always a lot of concerns about the Pacers. It's, and I love what I'm seeing from Derrick Rose. I... I hesitate to say this just because it's such a risky statement. I don't have any concerns. I, I really don't. His shooting. He's jacking up threes like crazy, and I love it because you know I love floor spacers. I, he's made, what, like 52% of his looks from deep so far? Yeah, the other night against the Thunder, he went 4 of 8. And I looked it up. He's made four threes before in a single game for his career, but it hasn't been that many times. And he's shooting them, like, not even with that, like, oh, I'm super open, let me just shoot it. But, like, they're just coming so naturally, and it's almost like he's looking for them. And that's a good facet of the game to develop because, yeah, he's a great rim attacker, but, you know, let's not watch him hurt his leg again. So I, I'm not concerned at all. Like I told you, there are at least three other players on that roster whose health I'm more worried about than his, which might be slightly stupid, but it's just where I'm at at this point. Also, how in the world is anyone going to score on a lineup with Derrick Rose, Jimmy Butler, Lou Dang, Taj Gibson, and Joe Kim Noah? Well, first, you got to hope that Noah's actually in that lineup. Sure. you got to hope that Gibson's in that lineup. Thibodeau has to... What? You have to hope that Gibson is in that lineup, because he's getting injured, too. And Tibbs has to use him. I didn't feel like when he was healthy, I didn't feel like he used him enough last year. And they yeah, signed him to that big contract. The bench. I don't... I think it depends. I, I will agree with you if the Bulls prove that they have more than Rose on offense. Because if you take Boozer out... Who can really create their own offense? I want to say Jimmy Butler, but we don't know yet. Like, we only really saw him in the playoffs. 
But if, like, Mike Dunleavy can come off the bench and drain threes, and if um, Butler proves that he can score, I mean, Dang is always a wild card on offense. He worries me. He'll get points, but I feel like he's been able to capitalize off the double teams off Derrick Rose. He's able to just, like, slither through defenses. It's ridiculous. And his efficiency when he does it, when he settles for jumpers, or when he's actually trying to create for himself or cover, it's not, it's not that great. It's sort of interesting to me that even though Thibodeau is pretty commonly referred to as one of that, like, elite group of coaches, you know, the one led by Pop, that that's our biggest concern with this team. Like, can he manage that rotation well enough to keep everyone healthy? Can he avoid giving ridiculous number of minutes to all the starters so that they can they can stay fresh for the playoffs? Like, how often do you hear that about a coach who's, who's almost universally known as one of the elite signal callers in the league. Well, you don't, and he's the antithesis of Popovich in the sense that Popovich does nothing but manage minutes well. And this is probably another example where people are overrating defense. Not in that his defensive system is incredible. It might be the best in the league. But his offense is so simplistic, and without Rose, like, it was nothing. So we're talking about him as an elite coach. The Bulls aren't an elite offensive team without Rose, and with Rose, you can make the case that they're not elite either. Like, they're... Offense is so Rose-centric that it's too simple. And he's the type of player you could do that with. But, like, the other sets, like, they're picking rolls. Like, how often do they use those? Barely ever? See, I can I can see that Rose-centricity changing this year just because he's never played along a shooting guard that works as well on both ends of the court. You can make an argument for, like, some of the guys really early in his career when he wasn't as prominent a star. But... As you said earlier, Butler can create his own offense. I remember seeing him pull off some, like, step back, like, through the leg dribble, fadeaway jumpers during the playoffs. And Rose hasn't had that in a long time. So I think the combination of him easing the pressure and everyone else around him actually is a solid offensive player. Maybe not consistent, but Dan can create his own look some of the time. He's a good shooter. And I, I think we're underrating well, Nova's defense offense might, a little bit here. I think you might be overrating Dan as a good shooter, but carry on. I could be, but I think I think he would be a good shooter if he didn't play 82 minutes a game. <laughs> yes, I would, no. you know what? You're probably right there. He's, he'll lose his legs. He's gotten a lift on his jumper. Uh, what were you with, saying about Noah, though? Well, with Rose and Noah both in the lineup, they have two people who can facilitate. Which is great, but again, I am so concerned about Noah. Like, in, I'm going to have to make people grasp how concerned I am because... I'll be shocked if he plays in more than 62 games this year. I'll be shocked. If he misses less than 20 games, I'll, I'll be astounded. Well, I think the Chicago fans everywhere are hoping you're wrong. Well, I think what also Chicago fans need to keep in mind, Dang is gone after this year. I think when they went into contract talks, the Bulls were kind of hoping that they were going to get him at like an incredible discount, and it didn't work out. So I think they're going to let him go because Chicago is not really one for paying a luxury tax, and they're going to have to pay Jimmy Butler soon. And you cannot let him get away unless you're going to use him in a trade for like a LaMarcus Aldridge or Kevin Love, which I wouldn't at this point. That's another story. But Dang is gone, so th- this is their year, really. And you don't know it's a boozer. They might amnesty next summer. So this is really their year because you don't know where Dang's going to be. You don't know where Boozer's going to be. And I know we hate Boozer. But he can still grab rebounds and score points, which on that team, especially the scoring, you need someone, especially because Noah doesn't score that much. Sure. I, I think that we can go ahead and take out the might for Amnesty and Boozer just because they they have to do it to get Nikola Marodic in the future. So that's that's a topic for another time because it's not really relevant for this season. So let's go ahead and move on to the Heat. I, mean, I know we both have them at number one. I don't want to talk about why they're the favorite. I want to talk about their ceiling. Can they win 72 games? No. They Definitive can't. no. No. I'm, well, one word, no. I, if Wade, if this, we're talking about Wade of like three or four years ago, maybe, but LeBron, LeBron doesn't have a, cons, I'll say a continuous superstar partner. Wade is still a superstar, but he is the, LeBron is the only every night superstar on that team. I don't even want to hear that Chris Boss is a superstar. Like that's just that's asinine. He's not a superstar. LeBron. Yeah, he's gonna he's gonna be studly. He might contribute, which is kind of scary that you, he could contribute on a team like the Heat. Well, the best sign from the preseason has been Beasley playing defense. 
Like, he knows that's where he needs to make his mark, especially in a Spolstra system, and he's done that. And that actually lets him get on the court. And if he can focus on that in his rebounding, he's going to be a rotation member and maybe even a part of the crunch time lineup. He, this is a great situation for him now because I know Miami has a pretty incredible party scene, but this is a great situation because this team has just won two championships, been to three straight finals. Like, he didn't have, he had Wade the first time around, but he didn't have LeBron, Badier, Allen whispering in his ear. And Coach Spo is the most underrated coach in the league still. So this is a great situation for him, and I could see him coming off the bench and contributing 10 points a game. So I think he'll be fine. But that brings me back to the fact, though, who's that second superstar every night? It's not going to be Wade this year. I know people, he's played really good in the preseason at points. We've seen it. But it's just, it's not going to happen. Inevitably, he always breaks down. I don't think I have as many concerns about Wade as you, but I, 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 do, I do definitively agree that they're, they're not going to win 72 games. The fact, that we, the fact that we even have to bring that up is, is a compliment to the team itself, but they, they'll, they'll be lucky to push 65, especially if they start resting starters down the stretch. I think now that they're going to have to go through two tough rounds in the Eastern Conference playoffs before making it to the NBA Finals, if they do, of course, I think Spolster knows that he's going to have to limit those minutes, especially for like the veteran bench. Coming down the stretch. If they were going to gun for 72, it should have been last year when there were all those injuries in the East. And what you were saying with the limiting of the minutes, like especially if they're preparing, like in the second round, they're probably going to play or maybe going to play one of the Pacers or the Bulls or the Nets, which all those teams are going to lay the heat on their asses. Like we saw Paul Pierce do it to LeBron James twice the other night, and it was it was the preseason. So that's going to be a concern that he has to do, especially with Wade. I wouldn't be shocked to see Wade playing like 28 to 30 a night this year, which seems insane, but I wouldn't be surprised if his minutes wind up under 30. The big question to me is, does Spolstra have the balls to pull a Popovich and give him a DNP old? (laughs) I think Spoh's too soft-spoken for that. I think Wade, and Wade is too proud to do it himself. The way that he just reacts to like these shooting guard conversations is almost like, a child not wanting to give up a lollipop or something like that, but it would that might be the point of his career. That he's at if if Coach Pop was the coach, that's where they'd be at. So I I don't know if he's gonna miss. I think if he misses games, it's gonna be extensively. I don't think they're gonna be like let's sit him here and let's sit him there or let's not play him on as many back to backs. I don't think it's gonna be like that. I think if he misses time, it'll be because he's injured and it'll be a significant period of time. I can see that, and I think they also might rest him against some of the real bottom feeders. I mean, there's no reason to play Wade against the Sixers. <laughs> I think the Sixers are going to win at least 40 games this year, so I think that you need to take them very seriously. I'm totally kidding right, right now, but... I'm, I'm going to hold you to that prediction. No, I'll be shocked if this... I know this is all time. I'll be shocked if the Sixers win... If the Sixers win 12, they won too many games. <laughs> Well, now the Phoenix Suns are actually in that competition for the worst record in the league, and we all know how Do much they, everyone wants Wiggins. Are they really, though? I think, I think so. I think they're definitely in the competition, but worst record is not going to be anyone other than the Sixers because they're going to trade one of, if not both, Thaddeus Young and Evan Turner. I don't even. It's not even going to be close. And like, I could definitely see Phoenix winning, like you know, between twelve and fifteen. But if they win between twelve and fifteen, the Sixers are going to win eight, nine, or ten. All right, I, I can see that happening. What do you think, back to the Heat, Greg Oden this year? What do you think is going to, if you, ceiling-wise, can he contribute to this team? If he does, will it be consistently? You know, I, I had a friend ask me today, over under 30 games played. And I laughed and then took the under. Like, <laughs> not, not only is he never going to play in back-to-back situations, but we don't, we don't have any idea when he's actually going to be ready to contribute to the lineup. His his four-minute stint during the preseason was solely to reward him for the work he's done. I think I think Spolster even admitted that he wasn't really ready for action, and, and that, that was nothing more than throwing him a bone to keep him motivated. Um, I, I don't think we see him debut until we're a little ways into the system and maybe a rotation has already been established, and even if he does, he, he's shown us he's shown us nothing in the last three years. I mean, he hasn't played a game to suggest that, that he's going to be a contributor. I mean, would I like to see it happen? Sure, absolutely. And he could be a great rebounder and defender if he can stay healthy. But I, I feel like it's just foolish. It's like it's like going to Vegas and playing slots all day. Like you're not those those aren't good odds. 
Whoa, don't let Vegas hear you say that, man. But I I agree to to a point. I think it's going to be a situation like him where because I, Spo did say everything you were saying, but he also was talking about how he's way ahead of schedule, which I kind of feel like is the party line. What is the, what is the schedule? Well, that's what I'm kind of getting to. I think I'm going to take the over. But if he doesn't hit the over, it's because he doesn't return to around the All Star break. Because I could see it being to a point where they're not gonna like usher him in until like February or after the All Star break. But I'm gonna take the over because the Heat would love his size. I know they have Birdman still, but they would love his size. And I think if he if he's healthy enough to play, he'll play more than thirty games. I'll be shocked if it's for more than twelve minutes. It'll probably be in that ten to twelve minute range. But I'm gonna I'm gonna take the over, and if it's not the over, I want to go on records now as saying it's because he didn't return till close to or after the All Star break. See, the only the only problem I have with that is that it's if the the Heat would love to have his contributions in the lineup, and that's sort of irrelevant. I mean, the Heat would love to have a prime Shaquille O'Neal in the lineup, but that doesn't mean it's gonna happen. But so. they, they have the freedom to experiment. Like it, it kind of brings us back to Beasley. They can take those chances because there's no doubt that the East is has some pretty good teams in it, but outside those top five teams, if you're the Heat, who are you worried about playing on any given night? Like, there will be slip-ups, but who you honestly think can beat the Heat, it, like, even twice this season, besides the other top four teams? The Pacers, the Bulls, and the Orlando Magic. <laughs> Is that serious? I'm kind of serious with that. I mean, the Magic were the only team in the division to beat them last year. I mean, they went 15-1 and against the division. And they also went to overtime and got a one point and got a one point win against Orlando. Vucevic is, is one of the guys that gives them the most matchup trouble, and that's as 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 silly as it does sound. That's the one team that I can see taking him down maybe twice throughout the season. Well, that's I feel like Tobias Harris is going to be like, um, like awesome this year. That's the only word I can describe it. But those types of games, though, that I'm t- those are the types of games I'm talking about where I could they're going to experiment. And they did it last year, sort of, when we saw them with, when Birdman first came on, they did a lot of different, like, experiments with him, and they were able to, you know, shuffle Bosch and Udonis Haslam around and everything. So, I th- like I said, if he's healthy, he's going to be used and he's going to contribute, because I think they have that type of freedom. And so I'm going I'm to take the over on 30, right? If he's, like I said, if he returns before the All-Star break, I'm going to take the over on 30. I'm feeling pretty you know, crazy right now. You know what would be the best part of him being in the lineup, though? It would mean slightly fewer highlights for Chris Anderson, so we wouldn't have to hear Birdman, Birdman, after a game. Oh man, yeah, th- that those got pretty tired out, and I love Shaq, but that got a little that got a little oh, yeah. tired towards the end. Uh, I, like I just the Heat, they're still an incredible team. I would still, if you had a pick, I would still have them coming out of the East this year. Who do you have coming out of the East? I know we have them as top team. Do you have them coming out of the East? I think I've got to still. I mean, they're they're built for it. Like, especially, I, I do think Beasley is going to actually be a valuable contributor this year, and that's that one spark that, that all the teams shooting for a three, three-peat have needed. I mean, it's, it's always about taking a risk and, and adding a, a bench player who might not be highly thought of, but is going to work out. And I mean, yeah, the Pacers were close last year. Yeah, the Bulls didn't have rows, but at the end of the day, like, the Heat are the most talented team, and they have the best player in the world. It's hard to pick against them. Well, if you actually look at that series, though, against the Pacers, like, the Pacers aren't... If we want to say the Pacers are a better team, they're not that much better of a team. And the Heat pretty much played that series without Chris Bosh and Dwayne Wade. They were horrible. And the Pacers pushed them to seven games, but still lost. But do you see a scenario in which the Heat don't make it out of the conference, aside from injuries? Like, let's, let's say, like, Dwayne Wade is close to Dwayne Wade for the playoffs... Is there a team over the course of seven games that that can beat the Heat? No, I, I, I don't think so. If if there's one that could do it, it's it's the Bulls. Rose has Rose hasn't put up the, the best numbers against the Heat throughout his career, but he's made them change their entire defensive system, and and ha- they've had to shift LeBron over to cover him, and that's kind of thrown the rest of the defense into a into a tailspin. Um, I I just I can't see it happening, but there is a possibility there. And with with the Nets and the Knicks, I, I don't think either of them have the upside necessary. I don't think any team in the East right right now has enough to beat the Heat in a seven game series. And I think what it's going to take 
and I, I'll, I'll still stay by this, even though they lost last year. The Knicks were the only team that were going to be the Heat in a seven-game series because of how they could shoot threes. And I don't, the Knicks included, I don't see a team that's going to be able to bombs away like that this year. I think that's what you need to do to beat the Heat because you're not, like, once you leave the perimeter, you're not going to beat them. Like, their interior defense was incredible last year. It was, like, fifth in the league or something crazy like that. And I think that that's just, and, you know, three-pointers are three-pointers. Like, because the Heat are going to score. So almost the only way to beat them is to outgun them because you can't, there's no way to defend that like, the Pacers couldn't do it. Like, when it was just LeBron, they could barely do it. So unless a team emerges as a three-point gunner, and I mean, like, really good. Like, I'm not talking shoot, like, 35%. Like, they need to hit, like, 37 or 38% of their threes. Unless a team emerges as last season's Knicks, but, you know, I'll say better, I, I don't even see it happening. I'll be shocked if the Heat get pushed beyond six games in a playoff series this year. Now that's bold. So I want to leave you with one final question before we call it quits on this one. We're assuming the Heat make it out of the eastern side of the playoffs. Who do they not want to see come out of the West? You know, right now, that's such a tough question because the West has never been more fucked up, if you just look at it. Like, because I can't even pick a clear-cut team to come out of the West. And I'm going to say this, too. If they don't want to play one team, they don't want to play the Warriors. Is it that three-point shooting? It's that three-point shooting, but they have a Dwayne Wade stopper in Iggy. Um, because if, and this is if Mark Jackson is smart, which I think he is, I think you put Iggy on Wade because you're not going to stop LeBron. So you make Harrison Barnes, who's a little bit younger too and might be able to handle the beating, or someone like that guard LeBron. I'm not sure if he'll do it. But that team, the way they can shoot threes, and if Bogut is healthy, like Bosch won't be a factor at all. So... I wouldn't want to play the Warriors. I think the Clippers are overrated. The Spurs would probably be my second team they wouldn't want to play. But the Warriors, is there anyone who would you have that they wouldn't want to play? You're not going to like my answer. You might even laugh at it. It's the Rockets. Oh, my God. For Houston to make it to the finals, all the pieces are going to have to gel. They're going to have to figure out the point guard situation. They're going to have to trade for a power forward or have one of the many young options they have emerge. But if they make it, they have the one piece that Miami can't even hope to stop. How are they going to possibly guard Dwight Howard? Greg Oden. <laughs> the Rockets are currently a better version of that Orlando Magic team that gave LeBron trouble. Whoa, whoa, okay. whoa, whoa, whoa. The Rockets cannot shoot threes like that Magic team could in 2009, whatever it was, 2008, 2009. I think that's going to be the Rockets' downfall, even if they face the Heat. Because, again, this comes back to my three-point shooting. Unless they get rid of a Sheik... And I'm going to take it a step further. Unless they get rid of a Sheik and win and bring in some shooters, it's just it's not going to happen. It's just not only will they not reach the finals, but if by some chance in hell that they get that far, they're not going to beat the Heat. And the fact you're right, you brought it up, and I'm not laughing at you, but I'm laughing at you because you're not laughing right now. So I'm not laughing with you either. Fair enough. So. We'll leave it with that. Uh, let us know who you think would give the Heat the toughest matchup if you think they're going to be the team to emerge from the East. Uh, this is Dan Favalli and Adam Frommel with the Full Court Press. Take care, everybody.